Can you see the can you see the transparencies now? We see them fine. Please go ahead. Thank you. So I assume I have 15 plus five. Yeah. So I'll, I'll try to do it as fast as I can and as easy as I can. But first of all, let me say that it is a great pleasure to be here today with Jorge and all you uh, colleagues of my old career, many of you uh, colleagues of my old career, and I'm very happy to see uh, to, to be brought up to date on some of the issues that were so close to my heart 20 or almost 30 years ago. And I see that uh, there has been a lot of uh, progress, but I also see that I have missed a lot of fun. That doesn't mean that I didn't have fun. I changed into working on something else where my physics background uh, is being uh, very useful. So I became uh, very interested in the 1990s in answering the question uh, or giving an answer, providing an answer to the question, why is there life on this planet? And being a physicist, asking why is there life on this planet is equivalent to asking who ordered life? It's just like Ravi said, who ordered the moon? So who ordered life? And in physics, in particular the physics, which has been discussed uh, today here today, all you uh, look at in detail, in great detail, is even less than the first three minutes. Okay, so life is represented here in this transparency that you have here. You have a very succinct, I understand that many people in the audience may not know many of these things. So I'm going to give a very general colloquium style talk. So life is uh, depicted here in this, uh, throughout the history of the universe in this transparency. Uh, you have here the Big Bang, the cosmic microwave background radiation, etc. the evolution of matter in the interstellar medium. And between here, between the Big Bang and today, we have about 13.7 billion years, American billion years. The Earth and the solar system began to form about 4.5 billion years ago. The Earth itself formed uh, just a little bit after the solar system, maybe 10 million years after the uh, collapse of the cloud that gave rise to the solar system. And then the planet Earth was has been here for about 4.550 uh, million years. We don't know what happened. We don't know what was the material that came to the, to the planet Earth that deposited on the planet Earth, or even how the planets actually formed themselves and how they actually spread themselves in terms of a hierarchy with a, a various types of planets, rocky planets, a gas planets, a, a, and so on and so forth, a ice planets, etc. But what we do know is that in our planet, about 4.2 to 4.1 billion years ago, there was already liquid water on the planet. We know that experiment uh, observationally, we look at circles and we see inside the silicon crystals, we do see liquid water. So you, you age using isotopic chronologies, you uh, age the, uh, the, the silicon and the water, and you find out that it was between 4.1 and 4.2 billion years ago. We don't know what happened between 4.2 and 3.8 billion years ago or 3.5 billion years ago, but we know that by 3.5 billion years ago, we already had very simple forms of life in our planet, probably related to water. We don't understand what happened there. What we do know is that life evolved from about 3.5 billion years ago to uh, today in a way which has to do with extraordinary polymers, which are called DNA, RNA. And we do know that since uh, about, as I said, 3.5 billion years ago, DNA is on the earth. Life on the planet is extremely diverse. There are, uh, all of life in the planet can be described in terms of three types of uh, dom domains. They're called, the simplest life is called bacteria. The second types of life or domains of life are called archaea and the third, a class of living systems or domain of living systems is called eukaryota, eukaryotes. We do know because we can do phylogeny, which means the study of uh, the ages of these diverse types of uh, life on the planet Earth, we do know 
the bacteria have been here from about 3.5 billion years ago. Archaea have been here maybe from 2.2, 2.3, 2.4, we don't really know billion years ago. And eukaryotes have been here between 2 to 2.3 billion years ago. We do know that the life we know today on the planet is at least 3.5 billion years ago. But what happened between say 4.2 billion years ago and 3.5 billion years ago? We do not know, we don't have a clue about what happened. What is clear is that going from a simple molecules as we presume they were on the planet Earth at the beginning of the formation of the planet and water, going from there to DNA is a very complicated process which today, whose manifestations we do see today with a huge diversity. But the diversity that we see, which is huge, as I said, is very interesting also. It provides uh, information about the origin. It provides information about the origin because by looking at the diversity today, we can trace back their origin. Uh, by looking at their genomes, we can trace back their ages. We also can trace back how that, those genomes have evolved in their complexity. And we do know that everything we see today is due to the combination in a limitless form a, or, a, or limitless diversity of a number of very basic components. And what we do know also, and this is extremely important, is that this diversity of these components and their synthesis is controlled by chemistry. But even if you were to look at one of the simplest living things we know, for example, a bacterium, here you have an, a, a watercolor of a bacterium underneath in the southeastern part of the uh, southwestern part of the picture, you do have the bacterium. The, this bacterium is about uh, uh, three microns in length and about 0.5 microns in diameter. It's called Escherichia coli, it's a bacterium. If you look inside, it's full of different uh, uh, large molecules made up of these polymers, this uh, DNA uh, and other polymers. And if you look in details, for example, here, where you, uh, where one of the hairs of the of the bacterium is, or this cilia, actually, these long hairs of the bacterium are attached, and you look at it in detail, and you look at it using very advanced technologies uh, having to do with the study of proteins and so forth you do find that this is extremely complex. And in fact, the bacteria move their, their uh, cilia because they have like a turbo pump that actually moves them. And it's also controlled by DNA. So how did we arrive at this extraordinary uh, complexity? Well, like physicists, we like to think simple and then try and see if from simple we can go to more complex. And we know that all we see today in life is based and uses standard physical and chemical processes. There is nothing weird going on. It's all physics and chemistry, extremely well organized. We don't know how this organization took place, but what we do know is that there is a huge leaping complexity from the chemistry that actually controls uh, many things uh, having to do with inorganic life to biochemistry. And even if we were to be able to generate some form of biochemistry, generate DNA, RNA, et cetera, from simpler components onto life. So we have been asking, a number of colleagues and myself have been asking uh, how you can actually go from simple chemistry, if you could, to a complex chemistry, or a, if you could go not only to complex chemistry, but go to systems which may be habitated down here at about 4.1, 4.0 billion years or 3.9 or 3.8 billion years on the history of Earth. They lived there and then they evolved themselves. They had the basic properties and they evolved themselves. So uh, the idea that we uh, uh, decided we should pursue is try and see to uh, uh, accomplish this jump in complexity, try and see if we can generate as we do in physics, can we generate a mathematical description of life using physical principles? And then can you use that uh, descript mathematical description of life as a means, as a guidance to synthesize or make life, something like life in the laboratory? At this point on earth, we have only natural life as we know it. 
Can you make it in the life? Could you invent a new life or a, as they call it, a proto-life? And how would you do that? Well, that, of course, has been thought by many people, but one of the people who were fundamental in pushing the connection between physics and biology, of course, this is no uh, to everybody, is Erwin Schrödinger, who, was, who began in the 1940s, began asking questions about what is life and uh, questions which got muddled into defining life and so on and so forth. Uh, there is a more practical approach. Instead of defining life, there is a more practical approach, which is what characterizes all life we see. And this is the simple way of attacking or understanding how to uh, generate living systems in the laboratory. All life that we see in this planet, be they uh, bacteria, be they trees, be they uh, birds, be they fish, but not viruses, satisfies these four properties that you have here. They, all of them uh, handle information. They handle information which is contained in DNA, RNA, etc. All of them with that information are capable of, uh, they have a chemical system which is capable of actually uh, taking a material from the environment in which they live and combine that, uh, those materials and generate parts, parts which will make children, which under the control of that information, the parts generated through metabolism will actually assemble in a way which is programmed by the chemistry which controls the information and give rise to systems living systems which self-replicate and which are actually capable of adapting to the conditions of the environment and change in such a way that they survive as much as they can. All these four properties involve out of equilibrium chemical systems. And you can ask, can you A, unify all these four properties into some form of equations? And then can you make a leap and go from those equations to uh, uh, actually do something in the laboratory. What I will explain in the next <laughs> in the next nine minutes, I will explain how you do that or what you can do and uh, where we are right now. So the four properties can be a, a minimal uh, expression of those four properties is that you would like to have a chemistry, make some chemistry, which is a mechanism to react uh, one molecule with another. And then you also would need to transport the molecules. And that leads to something which is called reaction diffusion of the molecules. This is something that uh, Alan Turing was thinking about already in the early 50s, a little bit before the, dis the disgraceful time when he unfortunately had to take his life. You do need at least two substances, one which is uh, the outside of the cell and the other uh, which it contains the food and the other part, the other uh, uh, material or meta uh, chemical uh, substance or substances, which is a, a is the cytoplasm, is the interior of the cell. And then you would need an environment which would be random. And uh, that ra random environment would produce noise. The noise uh, would be the chemistry, would be in a number of the, phys of the physical constraints in the system. And then the system would, if it did this, it, then it would be able to represent the above properties, if their, their chemical reactions they involve, uh, were able to represent information, for that you will need, you can show that you will need um, at, at the least a quadratic polynomials in U or V, and you would need autocatalysis, which essentially is the same type of po polynomials. Then for self-replication, you will need cubic interactions, and then for evolution, you will need two, uh, uh, two feedback loops in the system. So then you could think of a spherical cow and say, okay, I'm going to uh, see living systems have a boundary which generates a, a gradient of free energy. Uh, we are going to try and see if we can implement all those, uh, take all those uh, conditions that I mentioned earlier and reduce them to a minimal system. This has been known for some time, this uh, type of system. And uh, with, uh, this, with two of these equations, and it, uh, mm, there is a third equation, which is uh, you have here, the one describing the matter, uh, U, uh, the food, U, V, which is the cytoplasm, and C, which is the, uh, the uh, debris that the system actually puts out. In, the 19, in 2003, several colleagues of myself and myself put together 
a paper. You, if you are interested, you can look for my name in uh, PRL uh, 2003, and you will see there a system of those equations with a stochastic term there, which depending on the, uh, the parameters that you put in the system, it, let me see if I can make the movie go here. Depending on the parameters, the red is the foot, the rest, the other colors are the system. It generates that. If you change the parameters in that system, then a different type of parameter, this is what you generate. These are the firms the shapes, the systems that you generate. If you change the parameters, there is, there, are a, there is a fairly wide regime where this is what you get. So from these uh, apparently innocuous equations, you get systems that self-replicate, you get systems that actually do very interesting things that living systems do. So it is feasible to actually generate systems imitating the properties of life with very simple equations, reaction uh, uh, diffusion equations of this type, and where there is a stochastic term, there are stochastic terms which represent the contribution of the of uh, the uh, uh, environment. You can actually look at that in more detail and do computer simulations, which is what you're seeing now. In a minute or two, in a few minutes, you will see uh, actual microscope pictures. And then if you look at uh, uh, the kinetics, if you look at these equations, these equations happen to represent a very famous chemical system. We didn't know this when we did this. It represents a very famous chemical system, which is called the beluso sabotinsky chemical oscillatory uh, uh, system. And this system has many interesting properties. One of them is that it oscillates, uh, uh, the, uh, it oscillates in redox, which means that its free energy essentially is Oscillate, it's oscillating, it's energy is oscillating. The oscillations are nonlinear. That's very important because it relates uh, uh, the amplitude to the period in a, in a way which is non-trivial. And that actually allows you to use, I got the, the beep, uh, it allows you to uh, have a, 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 the possibility of using this reaction, this reaction by using the amplitude and by using the time to actually implement a computer of some sort, but uh, which uh, uh, we we have done. So, so Juan, I'm sorry, uh, this is the chairman. Uh, you, you have uh, running a bit over time. You, how many slides do you have? Don't worry, I can have one if I want to. Maybe if so you how many minutes? Now. Yeah, that would be nice. How many, Thank you. how many minutes? Uh, well, you're again, you're a negative number of minutes, but if you- Come if on, you I mean, come on. I started at, at, I started at 115. You said 20 minutes. Uh, anyway, that anyways, includes questions. That includes questions. Yes. Sure. Sure. If you could run so, up now, that would be good. Thank you. Thank you. One can. Uh, uh, never mind. So you can actually make uh, use that type of reaction. With that type of reaction, you can actually uh, uh, make molecules which actually will self-assemble into vesicles. Those vesicles that uh, you see there have micro size. Those micro size vesicles can. Uh, are generated can be generated in very simple configuration in, in a very simple experimental configuration. You can actually uh, uh, create them in, in a, or generate them. I like I don't like to use the word uh, uh, creation. If, if you can use them. Uh, uh, you can actually look at them with a microscope. And here is what they do. Assuming. So this used to be a homogeneous system. The chemical reaction in the homogeneous system actually is controlling the formation of those vesicles that you see there. The uh, scale is 15 microns. You will see that they collapse. When they collapse, they actually produce spores. Those spores uh, actually uh, go in the environment and they replicate. You can see how they are replicating, how they are increasing their numbers. And there is a pathway to actually generate systems which do self-replicate in, uh, in the laboratory. What we generate is not a, a, like here in the cover of the New Yorker, a, a molecule, a, a, a living system with all kinds of complex structures, but it's more like the Chemex, a, a coffee maker. 
And with that, uh, with uh, uh, what we learned there, we are actually able to uh, begin to think in terms of uh, scenarios that we can uh, maybe hope to see uh, one day in one, uh, uh, hang on a second now, uh, scenarios that we can see in other planetary systems or the many planetary systems that we know exist. So we have developed, a, I, will, a, I will leave a, a, these conclusions here. And if there, a, we have like a minute, I think, or two minutes maybe a, for, a, for questions and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks for a fascinating talk. I'm sure there'll be questions, let's see. Yes, I have a question. Please go ahead. Um, well, you, you, you characterize uh, life with some uh, you know, information, metabolism, etc., And then you have these equations that somehow, um, you know, just set the dynamics by themselves. So my, my question is, how would you characterize in that case, uh, death? I mean, this is a, this is a, <laughs> this is a wonderful question, okay? Death is characterized by the inability to uh, uh, repl replicate anymore. Okay, so if, if you look at bacteria today, bacteria don't really die. They die after 200 cycles or 300 cycles. If you were to look at the, uh, at the objects that I showed, that I showed to you in, in the picture, you, uh, in, in the movie, and I'm trying to find it uh, very quickly because I don't want to, of course, impose upon anybody. Uh, what you do see, is that these objects do this. They grow. I assume that you're seeing my transparency. Yes. They grow, they grow in size and then they reach a size and then they collapse. Then they reach it. Once they collapse, they grow again and they do it a number of times. They, nice. uh, the ones we can produce in the laboratory, which by the way, no DNA, no uh, biochemistry is used for this. You see you're a physicist and you do see, you look at the average a, a radius of the object and you see that it is decaying. It comes to a point where the system is not big enough to actually be able to survive and it doesn't reproduce anymore. So that is what would characterize death, but there is much more to be taught, to be spoken about death than what I just right. said. Right, okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, last question from Alfredo Yorio, please. Hello, can you hear me? Very well, Alfredo. And perhaps I, cannot, you are... I cannot see you. You want to see me? It's up to you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So thank you. Thanks for the talk. Very nice talk. Uh, I have a question, uh, like a general question. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, the beautiful lectures by Schrodinger, uh, we all learned that, that he, he was very keen on pushing on the quantum origin of life. He has this beautiful view that the diversity of life, he comes from the fact that the life is the effect of a molecule uh, that is not periodic, a non-periodic molecule. So this non, like a, a periodic uh, a structure will give a, a rise to a standard solid. Now the lattices, the, 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 the structures we know in, in, in condensed matter, then when you make this thing non-periodic, you will have the, the diversity of life. This is the, one of the messages of, of, of Schrodinger. So I wonder where in your beautiful model this message is hiding. Uh, if there is any quantum in your, in your, in your thing, thank the you. Quant thank you so much. Th that was a very nice question. It requires a lengthy answer. I'm gonna be short, Mr. Chairman. Don't worry about it. Uh, uh, it requires a very lengthy answer. But yet, short answer is, Ed, uh, Edwin Schrödinger. Much as we love, and I in particular, adore him. He we, was we not all right. Him. We all love him. Yeah, <laughs> I, I adore him. <laughs> Uh, he was not right on the uh, um, periodic quantum crystal, but quantum mechanics plays a very important role in all this. And it plays a very important role because quantum mechanics is at the basis. I'm putting there a transparency so that you see what a bacterium looks like, a, a bacterium today looks like, okay? You have there a lot of molecules and so on right. which are interacting with themselves. The, the molecules are packed inside uh, in, inside, and that's where quantum mechanics actually uh, plays a very important role. But the notion, and I will finish on this, uh, I mean to be very respectful, uh, the notion that, uh, that quantum mechanics is uh, playing some role in the active 
a waste of life was wrong. Was wrong, it is proved, or it's like, uh, I mean, there are it, many it, phenomena which, which, you know, like for the message, the message that it was mm -hmm. a, 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 a quasi crystal of some kind is wrong. It's wrong, or I mean, it's proved that it's been wrong, or there's, there is a line of research there that it doesn't it, make sense. It does not make sense. Yes, it's in the that, light of current mm -hmm. life. Okay. okay. In the light of life we see today. So life is not like a crystal or yeah. a, any special type of crystal. Life is much more complex system and life is a system which is capable, this is very important, is capable of adapting. Adaptation is a fundamental property of life. Okay, great. Uh, sorry okay, to interrupt I, you. I, I partially disagree, but that, thank you. Yeah, but I think we have to stop the discussion no, 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 here. We have one more last talk of this session. We should move on. Thanks again.